gone anywhere. Yeah. Um, all right, well, and with that, I would thank you. We have one more panel coming up, and uh, Madam Mayor, go O's. And uh, thank you very much. Okay. So I want to just ask you guys, just to jump right in, both the politics and the substance, is our cities the place where you have to innovate now? Just the, the sort of unit of analysis, the size, and also is it the place where you can go to get away from some of these strident politics? Great, well, thanks for having us. Uh, you know, at Lyft, in a, in a big picture sense, we're working to reimagine how human services operates to have more long-term success with families, because we all know the big poverty stats in America right now, but if you peel down a level, you know, two-thirds of all people who cross over the poverty line within a year fall right back under. And so we've, we've built systems that aren't very resilient in terms of their solutions. And a lot of that's because our human services system doesn't operate the way human beings operate. Our federal authorities are incredibly fragmented, so delivery is fragmented. You get fragmented systems delivering fragmented results that don't last. But we also don't tend to be very good at being responsive to people themselves, uh, especially poor people. And in our view, cities without a doubt are our best shot at completely upending the conventional delivery system for human services. It's going to take way too long if we're going to wait for the federal government to try to figure out how to knit together authorities like Secretary Castro was talking about. But mayors with generally you know, city councils that they can move have the opportunity uh, to exert their executive authority and a mandate to be more responsive to constituents. So resoundingly, yes, we believe that, that cities are the place to be focusing right now on uh, really transforming the system. And, and, and again, is this, because of, is this because of sort of substance, the size, some of the things that Kirsten talked about, or is this also just uh, it's the only place where the politics are working. I right think now. it's the only place politics are working, but I also think there's a generational shift that Steve was probably at the uh, beginning of, which is there's been a new generation of leadership that you saw two of them just on the stage here, where they're basically, I think it was pretty unusual uh, even 10 years ago to hear mayors sit here and say, we're going to take risk, we're going to fail, and we're going to move on. And, and uh, we see that all the time. S uh, S Steve and I, uh, Living Cities and the Ash Center at Harvard run a network of chiefs of staff of mayors, including the Mayor Nutters is here today, and, and, um, and policy directors. And what we found is that there's a real hunger um, by the mayors in the largest cities around the country to actually figure out what works, as the mayor said, steal, borrow, but more importantly, quickly implement and be willing to change if it's not working. But there's a real um, energy to adopt innovation and to really focus on what works, to get back to the the point we're talking about here. I think people are frustrated by the billions of dollars that are spent every year and not actually moving the needle on the nation's biggest problems. And so it, they land in place, and that's where the mayors uh, really see this, uh, want to see the results. All right, well, Stephen, you've seen this again as mayor. You're now at Harvard, and you're studying this and leading a project there at, at the Kennedy School. We've, um, uh, you've also been involved later in, in campaigns, in national campaigns. You've seen this sort of from the political side, the substantive side the operator side. What's your take on this question? Are cities the only place? And, and if so, why is that? Well, I've spent 30 years working in cities, so of course I'm somewhat biased in the answer. <laughs> so the answer is yes, but let's make it a little more complicated. I mean, you, you have had today an unusual set of leaders on your panel, right? These are not just average folks. They're exceptional leaders, and, and, and they're committed to change. I, I thought that Mayor Nutter's comment that you shouldn't be a mayor if you're not prepared to say no to your friends was maybe the top statement of the day because we can make the, it, it, it is true that a city of a million Indianapolis uh, you know 800,000 plus uh, uh, New York City was a little bit bigger when I was there but they're all places where you can actually produce change but at the same time no matter whether it's a city or state the federal government the people who are uh, uh, committed there are people committed to the status quo who are much more intense about their commitment to the status quo than those who are for change or for change, right? There's just this disequilibrium, and it takes a really strong leader with a really appropriate ap approach to kind of operations and policy and evidence and, and rhetoric to make those changes. So I, I agree with the proposition and certainly with what uh, has been said, but I wouldn't underplay the uh, difficulty of managing transformative change even at the urban level. So actually that anticipates my next question, which is, how do we start to move more cities? Because when this event was being put together, you know, we, we heard from an all-star group of current and former mayors, but 
we wouldn't be being transparent with you if we said the list of people we were choosing from was 300 deep. There's a sure. pool of people who are doing this, and they're the people we all know, and we said they're the kind of people you should get up on this panel. So how do you start to foster this culture of innovation a little more? That's a question for, for all of y'all. Yeah, so I, I think there's a number of institutions. We're, part, uh, we're made up of 22 of the world's largest foundations and financial institutions. And hi there, Trace, how are you? And, uh, and what we're really about is how do we actually help government to do this better? I mean, I think for all too long, we as a, as a people, and I think philanthropy generally, said we're going to work around government. And we're going to nonprofit our way out of our problems. And then we're disappointed when we have 1,000 people helped when we need 100,000 people helped. And the majority of dollars are in government and in the private sector. And philanthropy can help grease uh, the wheels. You know, uh, Bill Gates, is, all of his money is a day and a half of the federal spend. Mm -hmm. right? So if we really want change, it's not going to come from philanthropy. It's going to come from redirecting the dollars that are being spent and not getting the results to places and, and ideas that are and approaches that are getting the results. And there really is no other way around it. And, and so what, what we all have to do is figure out how do we help the government play its role? How do we actually help nonprofits that are innovative partners with them to be able to be effective? How do we get the, the private sector to play their role? I mean, ultimately, we get better, more people employed and, more, and people with more income when we actually are creating more jobs. And, and so that's not going to come from the nonprofit sector and the, and the government alone, the kind of growth that we need. You know? So it, it, right. it really requires a very different way, a collaborative way of working. I want to stay on this idea of how do nonprofits partner. Before we do that, sure. uh, I'd, love to hear, Kirsten, yeah, I'd love to hear from Kirsten and, and Stephen on this issue of how do you sort of, how do we increase this culture of innovation? How do we broaden the, the, the set of mayors who are actually doing this? Well, I mean, this, this might jump to your next question, but I think there is some onus on the nonprofits here to also be taking our ideas to mayors. And, you know, I think not creating kind of an artificial wall uh, between the nonprofit sector and the public sector. Because I think what we've tended to find in really all of the cities where Lyft operates is that these, you know, mayors and their staffs and also agency leaders at the city level are hungry for new ideas. They're hungry for demonstration models that are working, that you know, one of the great uh, opportunities you have running a nonprofit organization is that you can be a laboratory for innovation. You can take even more risks in some ways than the public sector can take. You can kick the tires on new ideas and then package those ideas and take them for the kind of scalability that Ben has talked about. Um, undoubtedly, some of the cities that we're having um, the, you know, the most active conversations with are not surprisingly a part of this network. Uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of pretty cutting edge work on how to uh, borrow and steal a lot of the best ideas from the corporate world around consumer satisfaction as a driver of shareholder value um, and how to bring that into human services for the poor because we believe that actually constituent feedback can powerfully illuminate better ways to achieve economic results. Uh, and on Monday, we're sitting down with Mindy Tarlow's office, one of the uh, Moneyball All-Stars, who's brought together also lead officials from HRA, Department of Probations, and elsewhere in New York City to talk about how New York City itself can scale um, kind of a, a systematic constituent feedback process across their human services system. And you know, I think that's not a conversation though we would have felt empowered to have without even an effort like today's just to say, wow, you know, we actually have an obligation to go there, um, and we will be received openly. So. so that all sounds good, but is there sometimes a breakdown when I know when I was in government, nonprofits will sometimes come in with ideas that are sort of completely technocratic and just don't work with the politics. And there's politics can be dysfunctional, but sometimes there's just politics because people genuinely disagree about things, and as a leader, you need to figure out how to build, build consensus. So what, so what you just said sounds great. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm all in. I like that. Sure. But like, is there, is there a flip side? Do nonprofits sometimes not approach municipalities and other bodies in ways that, are, the ways that are sort of actionable and useful? Well, let, let, me, uh, yeah, let me answer that in your last question quickly. So I don't think nonprofits are the answer. I think nonprofits can be the answer. I've seen more status quo commitment by nonprofits that have the existing funding streams, right? It's just they're no different. They can be good or they can be bad. They can be entrepreneurial or they can be status quo. And generally, if you go into a community and you have a large array of existing nonprofits, they're absolutely convinced that their way is right. And if their results are not good, evidence-based results are not good, then they claim that the results are not good because they don't have enough money. 
right? So the, essentially, the worse off you are, the more you qualify for money, the worse you're doing, right? So, so in, and you know, Ben and I have done a little work on this. I'm all for the entrepreneurial spirit of nonprofits to prove uh, something can work that's not currently working. And when I was, you know, a long time ago, when I was mayor of Indianapolis, all of my venture capital to do really creative things with nonprofits in neighborhoods was foundation money, right? Because right. you can't, I mean, going to your city council and saying, uh, give me a little money to innovate and there's a 50% chance I'll be successful is just really not an appealing argument to make, right? So it's, so using, the, so that's one answer. And so that means that a mayor or a United Way director or somebody who has uh, a broad uh, platform in that community needs to say these results from the current nonprofits and the current government delivery systems are not satisfactory, right? And then, and then that provides an opportunity for, for change. And then, and then secondly, and this is not quite how you meant it, but but I do think that whether you know it's real clear politics or an organization that that creates the dynamic for community change, right? So think uh, Stanford Children on the education side, right? Because the general appeal that the public has to be galvanized. You're not going to have progressive results with regressive delivery systems, and that's kind of what we have today. So so you need some general support that demands change. At the same time, you have entrepreneurial support that provides the change. Then you can do the evidence base prove what works, and then try to get the current dollars repurposed. That would be kind of the virtual cycle, I think, of kind of reform at the urban. What else? Yeah, Ben, what you add to This is a really important thing. Yeah, How do you build is. this culture of evidence base? And you heard yeah. some, a group like Stanford Children. It's a, it's a very powerful advocacy group in the education space. Like, so you heard of the demand side, right. with city leaders. Like, what else? So, well, so the mayor, uh, mayor Nutter referred to their opening up of their data. You know, and, and there are these twins. There's opening up of data, and, there, and there's using practices that work. And, but the first question is, how do you know what's not working? And the power of the, of the open data movement, which is, you know, many of the cities are doing what the mayor said. They're opening up all their data. They're making it available. Chicago puts out gajillions of, uh, of, of data every day, and they don't interpret it at all. Yeah. Right? They just say, let, let the public sector, I mean, let the uh, civic sector interpret it and decide what they're going to do with it. But the bottom line is, if you really do drive your change based on the data, you do avoid a lot of this idea of, well, you know, you're just going to stick with the incumbents, whether they're for-profit, non-profit, or, or government. Whoever is not delivering the service, you need to be willing to move to approach to an entity that will. Um, but there's a real need right now to be able to take this open data movement and actually turn it into practical use so we can actually make better choices about where the mainstream dollars are going. Okay. And you have to have yeah. data, you have to have the right data and a complex enough multidimensional data systems because even as um, as the mayor of Baltimore was putting it, you know, it's the, the crime statistics weren't as simple as hom the homicide rate going down. She had to look at it also against community buy-in and in a context of sustainability. And so that's also part of why we think that sometimes one of the missing pieces of the what works puzzle um, or the left out pieces on the evaluation front is genuine, rig rigorously collected, um, systematically analyzed constituent feedback about what's working. Because sometimes we, we see the end game outcomes, but we actually misinterpret what got us there because uh, we don't actually go to people themselves and say, what, you know, what was it about that program that actually really helped you? What other elements to close this gap or build this sort of culture of, of evidence-based decision making? What other, what other, what other pieces? Should be on the table. Well, I, I have to plug Steve's book because he's not plugging it yet. <laughs> I thought that, I thought that's time. why he was Thank here. You very I much. thought that's why he was on the panel. <laughs> Looking forward up here. I was wondering where yeah. it was. Yeah, right. So uh, uh, Steve just co-authored a book on the responsive city, but there's a great part of it um, which talks about the use of technology to transform the way that citizens can engage with with their government, and I do think that is a really critical. When you're seeing five to twenty-five percent voter turnout. Um, we've got to do something dramatically different to re-engage uh, our democracy, and we have the tools now. Yeah. Uh, we just have to make them more mainstream. You know, you can easily go on and rate your teacher. You can't easily go on and rate your council member, right? I mean, it's some, that, and that's like 30-year-old technology. So, uh, you know, I think there, there are huge opportunities to engage the citizens, especially those who've long been kept out. We have new ways to get them engaged. Um, with technology, 80, 90% of low-income people have smartphones yeah. uh, involved in a number of different social networks. So we have to really look and invest in, in those new ways of, of uh, engagement. I, well, I, it's a, really a great book, and I really, <laughs> really recommend it. It's called The Responsive City. I'll come out here in, in lights in a second. Uh, 
So uh, let me reinforce two things Ben said from different directions. So one is how new uh, technology, social media and the like, can give voice to the underserved, right? Because these systems are, you know, I used to be, in, I started my political career in the child support world, right? And, I, uh, and every AFDC mom was my client, and, they, you know, we, we collected great amounts of money. But the system, they tolerated bad, uh, I thought they, I thought my clients, AFDC moms, tolerated inferior quality of service from the overall system. Then the child support movement got expanded to middle class moms, right? And they were so noisy, right, that, that they, they, they wouldn't take these inferior kind of results. And I'm not talking about our results in particular, but I just mean the way that folks are treated in the system. So now we have social media, and, and we have social media that ought to be a part of our, uh, joint problem solving and also ought to be a part of how to raise the voice. You know, what is your service like? What's the quality of your service? You know, does your drop chaining program work? You know, and so we can, we ought to be able to balance out this through that. The second thing, and then uh, uh, I'll s stop kind of talking about data generally, is, is um, so I think there's another problem. Uh, this session that uh, Ben and I had at uh, Harvard last week with the chiefs of staff of the 25 or 30 largest cities, Ed Glazer came and said, well, everybody needs a, uh, a random control designed experiment or they don't know or they can't prove what they're doing, right? So this is like, really? I mean, we can barely afford our programs let alone to pay for the, pay for the experiments. And, it, it, you know, it, but, but at the same time, I think if we said, look, there, there, are, there is a continuum of proof and, uh, you know, whether it's matched pairs or in the book, we talk a lot about predictive analytics, right? We'll, we'll mine data across a large number of data systems. We'll figure out what the outliers are in different areas, and we'll try to figure out what's affecting those outliers. So just, just, mention, I, I, just mentioning that I think that there is a lot that can be done along this continuum before you get to a $2 million uh, MDRC paid you know, matched pair program, which are, I mean, controlled experiment program, which are fine, right? And they're great things for the foundations to pay for, but there's a lot of day-to-day -day work where we're getting inferior results, where we could get much better results by, by identifying negative and positive outliers. So before we go to questions of the audience, one last question sort of on this, which you just teed up. How do you balance? So you do have values issues here. So how do you respond to, say, a, a union leader who, who will come and say, you know, yeah, whether it's a, an RCT or some other kind of, uh, there's a set of data that if you do this thing, it is going to be cheaper. Um, however, I think it's going to be bad for our community because of the displacement of workers, these other values. How do you have those kinds of conversations that sort of marry these, these you know, powerfully held political values out there with what you can sometimes see in the data, what you can see in the economics. Okay, so this is your uh, last question. You I'll try points. not to dominate the answer, and you can go this direction for rebuttal. But <laughs> I was going to say, this, you, you leave it to the politicians to answer that. This question. is a false choice. Your question presents a false choice, uh, <laughs> and that is that we're going to assume that uh, better designed, evidence-based systems that even repurpose dollars from that which works to that, to that which doesn't work to that which works are bad for the employees. And and. The fact of the matter is we got a lot of really good employees, think case workers and child supports, child welfare systems and the like, who, who, who are overworked, right? And, that, and they're overworked because we're not providing them the right tools. So if we, if we redesign the work, they can spend more time, whether they're giving restaurant licenses or helping kids who are, who are battered, they can spend more time where they can make a difference and less time where they're not making any difference, right? So I view these tools, evidence and technology and the technology tools as ability to dramatically change the commodity approach to producing government that, that I think demoralizes the average public servant and allows them to redeploy their time where it makes a difference. I think it's very hopeful. And, 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 and I'm sorry. No, you're, you're I, next. I was just going to be quick, quickly and say, you know, and what we see in, in this network, including from some of the cities that are here today, but I'm thinking about the Denver Peak Academy, where basically the employees of the city actually get together and say, how can we reinvent the way we deliver the service? Yeah, and, 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 you know, they're, one of the things that we've done for the last 40 years has, has, has uh, made the working for government not a sexy thing. And uh, I actually think there's a new generation that actually goes there. We see it. We see it every, every six months physically when the, the leaders from these cities come, uh, to come to Harvard, that this is an incredibly talented bunch of folks who want to take what they've learned and their energies and put it to new ways. And it's, it is a false choice because they're not making that false choice. They're actually saying, that's my job. Yeah. I think the woman from the Department of Labor asked a great question before, which is how do you start to bring this to the front lines? And 
Um, one of the things that we've done at Lyft is we run a, a simulation called Liftopolis, which is essentially the simulation of how our social services system operates within the cities that we're in. And um, influential people have to take on the roles of actual constituents and try to solve goals within a period and face the real barriers that um, community members face. And one of the things we've been struck by is that's, you know, in places like Boston, and LA, and elsewhere where we've done this, some of the most receptive people to this simulation have been public servants, um, people working on the front lines themselves who actually feel, in many cases, the same powerlessness that their clients feel to not, you know, uh, in, in terms of their agency. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that it's important that we don't just presume that the what works framework, that the evidence-based framework will be rejected by unionized employees of the I'm not presuming, but I will push on this a little bit. I'm like Fox Mulder. I want to believe, yeah. but I look at New York. So one, and, and, and so the education world, one of the most successful reforms you've seen in education in New York City has been charter schools. I mean, the data is just, it is clear. And they have, there's maybe other problems with them, but you have a cohort of very, very high performing charter schools that are, are, are not only outperforming other schools in the city, some of them are outperforming schools across the state, outperforming what we see with affluent kids. Yet, the mayor's trying to curtail their expansion. The public employee union, at least as of when we started this panel, is not saying this is going to be great for our workers and it's going to empower them. They're pouring millions of dollars into a political fight to, to curtail these schools. So, I mean, it, I, I get like it's a false choice, but. Is it in practice these things bump up against some really tricky politics? So I guess if it's a false choice, explain New York City to me. Well, I think you're looking at one part of New York City and you're looking at one part of the challenge, which is a charter school and a union thing. But we're it's one involved. part that serves 1.2 million kids. No, no, there, no. So it's but let me like let me just finish though. There, we're, we work with a network called Strive Together Network. It's more than three dozen. Uh, regions around the country who've said we're going to overhaul education from, from cradle to career and we're going to draw it's going to be driven by data it's going to be using what works um, from before they get into k-12 through k-12 to college and all of those places they've set ambitious goals they're looking for they're saying we're going to use data to see where it's moving and at least three dozen of them they are basically taking it on because it's actually not about the union it's not about the charge about the results and if you actually can get the political leader, the leadership, the civic leadership, not just the political, but if you can get the civic leadership around the table and say, we're going to drive the money towards the results and, uh, and we're going to track it and we're going to have, and, and whether or not we're getting there, that is one of the ways you get around it. And, it, and, and, but you can always have a place that's not ready to do it and they're just going to fight and there's not much you can do about that. But I think what I'm encouraged by is that's the exception not the, uh, not the, uh, what I'm seeing in the world of innovation and people looking for change, that problem is the exception. Okay, that's an optimistic note, good. That's Questions why we do this from the work. audience. <laughs> yeah, over here, and there should be a mic around here somewhere, but if you feel like you can project, go ahead and start. If you have a teacher, if you have a teacher voice, don't wait for the mic. <laughs> good afternoon, my name is Sam Quaker. I'm the mayor of Rapid City, South Dakota, so greetings from the Black Hills. And this question is probably for Mayor Goldsmith, but any of you can answer it. How do you see the role of comprehensive planning in all of this? I, in, in Rapid City, we've just undertaken a new comprehensive plan, and now we're in the process of tying it into our annual city budget using priority-driven budgeting. And I haven't heard a lot of talk on that this afternoon. I was just curious what your thoughts are on comprehensive planning and how that can help achieve the goals that you were talking about. Terrific. I'd welcome any of you all to... Uh, it's, it was an exciting t uh, opportunity to, to accomplish multiple objectives, right? Um, you know, one of the goals of a mayor is to make sure that uh, his or her uh, residents have confidence that tomorrow will be better than yesterday, right? That drives investment, it drives attitudes, it drives in involvement. And, and a planning exercise, unless you totally lose control of it, it can't, a planning exercise can do that. Planning exercise can elevate goals, right? I want to have a healthier rapid cities. I want everybody to be within five minute walk of a trail or a park. I mean, I, I, I'm gonna change the way we think about our community. A comprehensive planning process can actually produce value, right? Because if we rethink the zoning, uh, the obsolete ways that many cities used to zone, right? We, you can only do this in this section and this in that section. You can actually create value. If you think about zoning in terms of kind of uh, 
uh, diversity and equity, you can create better experiences. So I think that it, as long as you don't have too many goals, right, the comprehensive planning exercise is, is a terrific one if in the end it brings people together around the plan, if it, if it manages to kind of obviously fragment them, that's a different issue. It's a great, it's a great, great question. question. I'm embarrassed we didn't touch on Thank it. Thank you, Chris. Anything you guys would add? He's not in the room, but I mean, that's so much of what also Secretary Castro did in, right. in San yeah. Antonio. And starting to, to, to beat the same drum, but really by engaging also um, constituents themselves and setting the vision for the, what they wanted San Antonio to be and building the plan from there. Um, but it's a, it seems to have been a great exercise for them. Other questions? Sorry, and I have a little bit of my back turns. Anybody over here? I saw a hand at the second. Okay, yeah, don't be shy. How you doing? My name's Liam Sweeney. Um, I, I would actually uh, follow up with Andy's question about, I, I, I'm from Connecticut, and in Connecticut, um, <clears throat> we have a, a major battle going on in regards to education reform. In fact, uh, we have a governor who's, prob who's in a very tough election based upon that, and he's produced everything in regards to results-based accountability, um, and the numbers have just, he has had success in his last four years. But to Andy's point, the political implications have moved against him. So I guess I would kind of want a little more follow-up of how more states that you've seen that have had success in regards to using the numbers as well as, you know, political um, conversations, so how to connect the two. And I, and I guess one, one thing on that question, it does it get harder as you aggregate up. So is that a harder thing to do, for example, at the state level as a governor to tell that story as it would be at a, at a, as a mayor? I'd sort of put that as a addendum on the, on the gentleman's question. Well, I kind of like Ben's optimistic answer, and then we keep getting dragged back to your question. <laughs> but um, uh, let's just try to generalize. But l l let me get to teachers last, because I just think it's the most complicated, really. And I've had... Um, I'm a Republican mayor. I've had a great relationship with AFSCME, right? I found, uh, <coughs> and, and some of the SEIU local unions, where the, where the local president says the status quo is not satisfactory. <coughs> and we're going to partner with management if management will pay attention. Because the answer is not, the problem is not always the union. The problem is often the management between the mayor and the union, just not listening, right? So, so uh, I've seen pretty dramatic uh, increases in productivity in labor management partnerships, which, which I find to be very encouraging. Now, they have to be with kind of a win-win win agenda, right, which is give us your good ideas and we'll lay off half of your workforce. It doesn't feel like a way to kind of do this. <laughs> so that's one issue. A second issue is, and this goes back to evidence and technology tools, we have a lot of really hierarchical systems, right, and, and those systems need the men and women at the bottom. They don't need all the men and the women in the middle because we have ways to give people more authority now. We have ways to give them more discretion now. And, and so, those, so there is a little bit of bind here. But, you know, any, uh, any large governmental organization uh, uh, can manage its downsizing through attrition in a planned way. So, so I'm, I'm pretty encouraged about that. I do think that the, some of these wars between the teachers unions and the executive branch, uh, New York's around schools or some other places, are, are, are particularly complicated and complex, and I prefer for that purpose not to comment on them at this point in time. But I mean, it, I, it, there, there's a little bit of political, it's a little bit of distrust, it's a little bit you don't, you don't, you don't have confidence in the management, it's a little bit you don't know which tools work. You know, and the, more, the, la the less clarity there is about w the evidence on what works, the more politics will take over in the resistance. I think also your theory that you just laid out may have more explanatory leverage on this than you give your credit for, which is that bind you were talking about. I mean, the unions live much more there than they actually live with the rank and file teacher. And so when th these things are less about displacing teachers who there's going to be schools, kids are going to be educated, it's a labor intensive function. And, and the teachers unions essentially function as an intermediary and almost as a you know, quasi bureaucracy themselves, and so they may feel that may contribute to the politics. They may be caught up in that and feeling more threat um, than, than your average teacher would. Then the politics of that are you know play out in some obvious ways. But I'd answer your question is definitely local possible. Every step up, harder, harder, harder. You know, if you just think, uh, I think it was the sec the uh, secretary was talking about San Antonio having how many school districts? We were right. talking about that. You know, just in San Antonio, I think Houston has 35 or something. So, you know, as you move up to the state level, it's much, much. So you had what 12? There's 12 in Indianapolis, is that right? Yeah, 12 so schools. Really yeah, around the, the sort of East Coast county-based system is actually the outlier. Um, yeah. 
the country. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. And again, if you have a teacher voice, don't wait for the mic, or you can wait. My name is Mike Lawson with the Performance Institute. My question is the interaction between elected leaders and appointed leaders, and between between policy and management. And often here in this town, everything you begin is not about politics; it's about policy. Management is an implementation yeah. of almost no attention. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'd like, to, as a panel, to address right. how do you get good management, and what's the relationship? So I, I take it your point is that good policy, well, uh, good policy badly executed is not a perfect success. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's a really important question, and maybe it's a good one to close on. I mean, it, it, it used to be, even in, you know, I run the innovations program at Harvard's Kennedy School. It used to be our definition of innovation was a, a really innovative policy, right? Because it was it was cooler to talk about and. And um, today, you know, the work of your institute and others is focused on, on execution. Uh, it feels to me like you need three things, right? You need good policy. It needs to be well executed by the, you know, the bureaucracy or the professional management. And it needs to be well explained in terms of rhetoric to the public that will benefit. If you, don't, if you have one of those three things off, you're probably not likely to be successful. And, I, and I, I'm encouraged by um, how much more discussion there is today than there was five or ten years ago about management and operations issues. Yes. I mean, I think the definition, the most important characteristic for change and innovation is people. And I do think it's about the talent. And, and I think the, the more we devalue the service, the more we get the, uh, you know, what, what, we, what we're paying for. You know, which is bad service, and I think the more we say those are important work, and we attract good talent, and we give them some authority, you know, not uh, give them some chances to innovate, we get better talent, and therefore better results. And I, and I do think it ultimately is about driving good talent to the places that are going to make the difference in these areas. I mean, one of the things that was encouraging about the mayor's panel, not only that they both saw themselves as CEOs fundamentally, but was to also hear about the, the con continuity from their predecessors. And you also hear this from the folks that came after Steve, um, which is one of the challenges, I think, at the federal level or the congressional level is that there's this you know, often total overhaul of people, of programs, of ideas. And you do see some more continuity at the city level, which is, I think, one indication of the type of thing that we should raise up. Um, which is that you know you can't manage change if it's going to be uh, you know if the programs the people and everything else are going to be thrown out each political cycle because these are long long term efforts we're working on to combat poverty and expand opportunity in our communities. Please join me first in thanking our panelists on this panel, <laughs> Kirsten, Brad, and Steve. And then please also join me in thanking the entire Real Clear Politics team uh, for putting this together. Um, the Real Clear Education team just showed up to bask in the glory. It was, it was Meg and the Real Clear Politics team that does all the work. Um, and also thank Results for America for being such a great sponsor. And not only are they a great sponsor, they're a generous one. On the way out, there are some very cool water bottles um, for you to, t to take with you. As you think about Moneyball, you can take them with you. So thank you very much. Please keep in touch with us at Real Clear Education and Real Clear Politics. That was great. Thank, thank you. you. That was really good.